So Adam, you are uh, president of global revenue of Twitter. So let's talk about money. Um, uh, I guess when you joined Twitter in 2010, there was a lot of skepticism about the revenue model, the business model uh, of Twitter. And yet, as we just heard, you kind of killed the numbers last week. Um, you, you somehow managed to deal with the doubters now on the revenue model. Yeah, so I came to Twitter uh, four years, well, just over four years ago, and I came to open up the business lines. And I think four years ago, the questions were, you know, how, Twitter, how was Twitter going to generate revenue? And you flash forward four years later, and just in this past quarter, we announced a uh, revenue of over $360 million, $361 million for the quarter. That's up 114% year on year. We raised the guidance for 2014, so uh, giving a forecast of over $1.3 billion uh, in revenue. And in terms of billion dollar revenue ad businesses, uh, we're the fastest growing. There's no other billion dollar ad revenue business that's growing uh, close to 100%. So uh, the, the key piece is we feel like we're just getting started. Right. Uh, and there's a number of, uh, of products that are going to come later this, this next year. And, and how much of that is because of geographical growth? Well, so we definitely have, um, we've grown internationally uh, in a terrific way. Um, our international growth was uh, over 170% year on year. So we've just started putting people in each one of these markets. Uh, I've been on a two week tour across, uh, across Europe and meeting each one of the teams and customers and clients. In fact, just today, uh, we've got a product that's open for SMBs uh, across Europe and we're just opening up in the Nordics now today as well. Okay, a big day for the Nordics. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and talk to me a bit about um, the diversification of revenue, because well, this, you know, th is this kind of a, a pure advertising model? Well, so the advertising business certainly gets a lot of press, but one of the things that I'm most excited about and most proud of is the revenue diversification, as you mentioned. So we've got three lines of, of ways that we generate revenue. The advertising business is one on Twitter. Um, but the second line of business is our big data business. So we uh, license Twitter data out to third parties that use it to improve their own businesses. And then the third one is a very small startup part of the business called our commerce business where you can click to buy right from a tweet. Okay, I'd like to come and just talk about cool. each of those uh, in turn. But pre-IPO, Dick Costolo said that uh, we think of revenue not as a destination, but as kind of oxygen that feeds the model. So post-IPO, are you still allowed to think it's that a, way? It's a, great, um, it's a great quote and a great thought. The quote is, um, you know, we think of revenue like oxygen. It's uh, necessary for life, but it's not the reason to live. And um, of course, the, the other part of that line, at least the line that I say, is and then that the writers that only write about the revenue pieces are hyperventilating. Um, so, I, look, I think um, amazing companies um, build out products to um, change and touch the world, and that's certainly been the storyline for Twitter. And so I think, you know, we look at uh, building um, a brilliant product that touches millions of people. We hope to touch every single person on the planet. And revenue, of course, is a, is a byproduct of it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So just thinking specifically now about the advertising proposition, how has that evolved over just even if in this last year? Yeah, so there's been a massive set of evolution uh, right. on the ad business. Um, you know, we, but at the same time, it's, it's stayed, one core tenant has stayed the same, which is when we started the advertising business four years ago, we started with one uh, core ideal, which was build a business in a way that makes us proud. So that was the, the overarching uh, piece. And so what we decided to do was bring an advertising product that was more native and organic to the user experience of Twitter. We could have gone a different way. We could have uh, done what everybody else had done, which was bring banners or an interruptive ad experience um, and a disruptive ad experience to the platform. We decided to go what we thought was going to be a much longer path um, of building up this revenue stream. And it turns out it actually was much quicker. But the advantage of, a, of, of the monetization experience is that the ads look, act, and feel just like the organic content. Right. In a promoted tweet, you can do all the things to a promoted tweet that you can to an organic tweet. You can retweet it. You can follow the brand. You can favorite it, et cetera. And that yields amazing advantages. Uh, consumers, for example, that retweet ads with reckless abandon, um, where they're passing virally 
um, advertising messages out uh, to the world on behalf of those advertisers. And then NetNet, you know, it also, and most importantly, respects the user in a pretty important way, which is, um, which is tantamount in everything that we do. Well, see, so you probably have something more of a tension in the business now, because the market, I guess the quoted market, is kind of very revenue focused, wants you to push revenue hard, but you can still hold on to that, uh, the significance of the user experience, can you, in the face of all of that? Well, yeah, I think um, it would be a, uh, a great storyline if that tension was there, but in truth, uh, that's not how it is at all okay. on, the, on the business. Um, and part of it is in the way that we've set up the business. Every single thing that we've done has been around bringing all parties uh, in a collaborative way around the table. So um, the way the ad auction works, for example, uh, it isn't just how much you pay. It also is the, as a pay as an advertiser, it's also what the engagement rate is of the actual ad. And, and therefore, there's a financial incentive for the advertiser to actually provide good advertising content. Um, the, the higher the engagement, the, the less they can actually pay with inside of the auction and still win space. So, right. you know, we like to say there's an economic advantage on Twitter ads for advertisers to be good instead of just being loud like we've trained them for the last you know, 20 right, years in digital display. Yeah. yeah. And, and t just talk to me a little bit about the, the Twitter um, publisher network. Yeah, so one of the things that we've begun doing is um, begin, begun to take this Twitter ads product beyond just Twitter. Uh, about a year ago, we did an acquisition of a company called Mopub, which is uh, one of the world's largest mobile ad exchanges. Mopub sees a billion iOS and Android users every 30 days, so just massive scale. Yeah. And what we're talking about doing now, what we're working on, uh, is connecting the plumbing of the Mopub exchange through, uh, through Twitter so that uh, marketers can come to Twitter and spend on Twitter and then also extend out you know, to this billion plus audience that's out there. Right, uh, right, and uh, just on that score, you, last week you announced 284 million uh, monthly users. We did. Um, but you also flagged another number, which was kind of significantly bigger, 600 million, um, which includes visitors to the site who are not logged on, maybe not even registered. Are those kind of 300 million plus nomads like, monetizable? Yeah, so um, what we announced is uh, certainly 284 million people that log into Twitter to either consume tweets uh, or tweet themselves. Um, and that act that's good growth. It's up 24% year on year. Um, but there's also a much wider audience who experience tweets but actually aren't logged in, as you said. What we've said publicly on the earnings call is that that number is one to two times the size of the, of the logged in audience. And they come in many different ways. Somebody does a search and they end up on Twitter uh, to read tweets uh, from an actor, an athlete, a, a celebrity, a politician. Um, or you go across the web or even in some mobile apps and you see streams of tweets that the publisher has brought into their application. And um, those aren't counted as a part of the, of the uh, logged in user base. So we do have this massive right. untapped audience that's out there. We do believe there's a, there's a pretty interesting way to drive monetization. That said, we feel like we have a ton of headroom left in the core business. Um, and in some ways, we feel like we're just getting started. The ad loads, for example, is by, are by far and away uh, the lowest in the industry. It could be the lowest in the history of digital for the <laughs> size business that we have. Um, and, uh, and we still have a lot of good work left to do just on the, on the owned and operated property as a standalone. Right, okay. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about data now. So you have 500 million daily tweets, you know, that, the fire hose, I reckon, as you call it, uh, right? Right. Um, so, so what's the treasure in there? And how, do, <coughs> well, how do you pick the gold out of that? Well, there's, uh, we think there's a massive set of insights for businesses in, in uh, the Twitter uh, data. So here's what's unique about the data. As you mentioned, about a billion tweets every sent every two days, so tens of billions each month, hundreds of billions of tweets each year. And um, what's unique about this corpus of data is it's the largest, we think the largest public uh, set of public conversations that are out there. Um, and, and there are businesses that use data in the most interesting ways, Twitter data in the most in interesting ways. There are hedge funds, for example, that bring in the Twitter data to understand where they should trade. And they're actually making financial trades on the market based on Twitter data. They, 
quick story on that is they actually started by simply just looking at the occurrence of smiley faces or frowny faces with inside of the hundreds of millions of tweets, and it turned out it was highly correlated. The increase of <laughs> smiley faces meant that the market I uh, closed that day. Now the algorithm, obviously, for them is much more complex. Right. But uh, there's health companies that are looking for um, uh, to track uh, the the the, the uh, distance of disease as it crosses across countries because you can imagine people tweeting, "I'm feeling sick," and how that correlates to um, to possible cures. Um, so it's being used across the board. We just made an announcement, for example, with IBM uh, yes. last week. Uh, this is a pretty significant announcement. Uh, IBM announced they're going to bring the, the Twitter data into their IBM Enterprise Tools software and also their consulting services. They're going to train you know, 10,000 IBM consultants on how to actually take Twitter data to the enterprise. So we think there's fantastic opportunities for big business. There's also opportunities for small business. I'll tell you a quick story um, of, of just my the most interesting, I think, story about a business using Twitter data. So we got a call from a, a business a couple months ago that's a, that's a restaurant deep fryer. This is you go into a restaurant, you order French fries, and they put the fries in, and they deep fry it in oil, and they take it out, and they give you your fries. But well, these guys make the fryers. These guys make the okay. French fryers. These are the big, it's, a, it's like a $50,000 uh, uh, item that you purchase okay. as the restaurant owner. So very expensive. So they came to us, and they said, hey, we want to license Twitter data. And we said, that's great, but <laughs> I don't think anybody's tweeting about industrial fryers on Twitter, let alone your brand. And they said, no, 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 what, what we actually want to use it for uh, is to look for people that are talking about one specific problem with industrial fryers, which is if, you've, if you aren't servicing the fryer correct, correctly or if you need to upgrade, replace this $50,000 machine, the French fries that come out are soggy fries. And so actually what we want to look for are people that are tweeting about soggy <laughs> fries, and we want to go to that business and tell them that they should replace it. And here's social proof that your customers are complaining about. I did, it's a great story. I went to Twitter and started searching for soggy fries, and sure enough, there are thousands of people that tweet every <laughs> single day. Hashtag soggy, soggy fries. Hashtag soggy fries. So if it works for, <laughs> if it works for industrial fryers, we think the data business part, uh, the data, the Twitter data could be helpful um, in many different enterprises as well. Right, it sounds like you're going to feel you've only just begun in, uh, that, in there as that well. That business is, is uh, very new as well. Um, that business, we uh, acquired a company called Ginip, which was our major data reseller, right. brought them in-house, um, and uh, expect more from us soon um, yeah. on the data business. Okay. So uh, let me just, just turn to the third of the, the, the streams, um, commerce. Um, the buy now button launched in the US. It's How's it going? It launched as a beta, um, and it's a very early experiment. But what we saw is that there were people tweeting about products and services on, on the platform. But there was a big distance between discovering products and services on Twitter and actually making a purchase. Um, that said, we saw a lot of this activity. In fact, there were a number of companies that um, helped bring commerce together. With American Express, for example, you can sync your American Express card to Twitter. And just by tweeting, it, it took an offer uh, on your card at the, at the register. Or Amazon launched a platform called Amazon Card or Amazon Basket, where if you tweet uh, about a product, on Twitter, it takes that product and puts it into your uh, shopping cart when you go back to Amazon. And so we saw this great Ooh. organic experience that was happening. And what we decided to do was shrink that distance. And so what we have now is a button in beta where if, some, if you're tweeting about a product or service, that button shows up. And with one click, essentially, you can purchase a product right from the platform. It's early days. Um, we're experimenting with different price points with different products, and most importantly, what emotions you need to generate as a business to actually get somebody to buy now in the moment. And we think there's a really interesting, you know, the, the best thing about Twitter is that it's a live, in the moment platform, and we think there's a huge opportunity for live commerce in that way. Wow, so, so looking forward, you would, is it too early to imagine that you would see the split of, um of revenue between ads and data and commerce change quite dramatically? Well, so uh, it, it definitely is um, already uh, rising. All, all, those businesses all those business lines are rising. The data line that we announced uh, grew something like 171% uh, year over year. So that certainly is a high growth part of the business. The e-commerce business, <laughs> we're starting 
um, in an in a, in a incubation mode with inside of the company. What we're trying to understand first is uh, and prove to those marketers that we can actually move transactions, we can move yeah. goods. And then once that's in place, you know, a, a variety of business models come into play. Fascinating. Okay. Now, I, I, just between the two of us, I want to confess <laughs> to you that when Twitter was first launched, I, I really didn't get it. You know, I thought this was going to be for kids to say what they're having for supper that night to, to each other. That's but, evident by your handle, by the way. Yeah, I know. At, at Crimson Tweet. Twi twit. At, at, at Crimson Twit. Crimson Twit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought this thing's kind of moving through. There's no need to take this too seriously. Um, uh, so, so did you get it? When, when Twitter first came out, you were at Fox, right? Yeah, when I was, uh, when I was at Fox, um, I did. I was a really passionate user of Twitter. And um, what excited me about the, the company, <coughs> company and the platform is that um, I was so excited about the product. And here's, here's what I knew. <clears throat> you get into a different mode as a user of Twitter. Uh, you get transported almost to this different place mentally. You get in this mode of what's hot, what's new, what's going on in the world, or what's <coughs> happening in my world. And from a monetization perspective, um, all we do in the monetization business ultimately is monetize emotions. And those four uh, questions that people come to the platform with, those four emotions, what's hot, what's new, what's going on in the world, or what's happening in my world, I thought was one of the biggest opportunities that was out there in the business. Uh, it turns out market or businesses can answer those questions in pretty relevant ways for consumers. Right, right. And what's exciting you now when you kind of look out there? Well, so one of the things that we just announced is an is a interesting transition uh, of the company and expansion of the company, you know, that, that has been under the way, underway for the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, we were a singular product company, Twitter. Uh, then last year, we increased that to be multi-product, Twitter and Vine, our six-second video service. Yeah. And just a, about a week ago or so, um, we announced the launch of Fabric, which is a set of services and, and um, software for mobile application developers. Um, and so for us, it marks a move into being a full-on platform company. Uh, and within inside of Fabric, there are different kits that mobile developers can take and use to help build and speed their development to market as a developer. And most of these things have nothing to do with Twitter. Uh, these are. Um, an easy way to drive login just by through phone numbers. This is called a, a, a platform called Digits, or an analytics platform. And then, of course, we also, as a developer, if you'd like to make generate revenue in some of the same ways that Twitter generates revenue through native advertising, we have a platform there, uh, MoPub, that you can take and bring into your app. Right. Uh, it's not required, but it certainly is. Uh, we th we hope to be interesting for for developers. Right. Okay, and uh, sort of final question. So outside Twitter, what, what are the developments and, and what are the companies that uh, you think are, are really exciting to watch? Well, you know, companies <laughs> overall, there, there are a bunch of really innovative companies. I'll give you, I'll, I'll take it in a slightly different mode, which is one of the things that we've been spending time at at the company are talking about uh, people that are doing interesting things and how that relates back to business. So in his, we were talking about history on the way in. Uh, into, the, into the building, there's a really famous uh, person in, in history named John Landy. Do you know who John is at all? No. <clears throat> You'll know his, uh, his uh, someone in his field, uh, uh, Bannister, Roger Bannister. Uh, oh, yeah. So John Landy was a, an amazing runner uh, and was, was born in the 1920s and was the fastest runner of his time. And he ran a uh, mile and also marathons. Uh, but he could not break the four minute mile. And he was constantly trying to run. And he, the fastest he could do was four minutes, two seconds. Uh, and he famously went out and said after just getting to four minutes, two seconds, mile after mile after mile, race after race, he went out to publicly and said, you know what? I, it's, I don't know if it's possible to break the four minute mile. I certainly can't do it at all. So it's not going to be uh, from me. Sure enough, a month later, Bannister breaks the four minute mile at three minutes, 59 seconds, which lasted for a total of six weeks before <laughs> right. John Landy went and broke then the four minute barrier himself and went on to break it about six more times. It's a great story because if you think that something's impossible, if you think that you yourself can't do it, uh, really your only competitor is from within. It was actually just within John's mind that he couldn't break that four minute barrier. That's a great story. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks Been for having me. Adam Bain.